We're going to move into the discussion phase. Uh, we have about uh, 49 minutes until lunch. Um, and uh, first, let me let me also just uh, make a comment and maybe start off a question, but I'm not going to let, let Carol um, uh, not have a chance as well. So first, uh, as a somewhat outsider to this, uh, to this area, um, I'm really impressed by the extensive number of tools that have been developed. We, we heard from Simona this morning, but also in this session about an extensive number of tools, both for researchers and, and potentially for clinicians. So it just seems to me that this is sort of begging to create a universal pharmacogenetics repository that can be accessed by the research as well as the clinical community, because I'm not sure that I, maybe I missed it, that these things may reside in different areas and not everybody may, not all the users may actually understand the value of the tools that you guys have developed. So that's just more of a, a comment. My question is, um, I heard, we heard from Mary that, um, that even now uh, a number of the CPIC gu guidelines are un undergoing updates. Not surprisingly, as more data is generated, um, more um, th those guidelines will change. But the guidelines are also being used um, in many instances to, to derive the clinical decision support rules. Uh, that are, um, you know, used at, at, at a variety of healthcare systems. So how do we avoid the, the situation in which uh, if a patient goes to two different hospitals with the same data that they're actually going to get the same recommendation? So how do we think about the utilization of this, of the CPIC, foundational CPIC guidelines to ensure that the CDS is actually uniform across the institutions that are developing CDS uh, rules? Well, the first step is to have CPIC be a reliable source of updated information, right? I mean, I don't think it would be appropriate for us to say because the healthcare system moves slowly and in mysterious ways that are non-controllable that we should not try to update CPIC guidelines when the information needs to be updated. Do we have control over how these myriad EHR systems deploy their CDS? No, we do not. I mean, we're trying to have only one version of the CDS for every CPIC guideline out there on the website, and unfortunately, we don't have a seamless way of populating the myriad systems that healthcare systems use to deploy their CDS. At St. Jude, I, you know, I've been the um, biggest um, loser in terms of having to update our CDS more constantly than anyone because we started so long ago. Vanderbilt's probably about the same. I mean, we've, we've had to completely redo much of the details of our CDS based on CPIC guideline updates over the last seven years, and it's a problem. I think that's why what Sandy's doing is so critical. If we can possibly get to standardized terminology for the test results, that would be, again, huge. <laughs> Right, because it's the test name that's probably the most important thing to drive. It may be the phenotype designation as well. Um, so, so the test names and the phenotype designations, if those could be standardized, then when the CDS updates, it's not a crazy idea to update the CDS going along with those test names. But if you don't even have a way of looking for what test names and pharmacogenetic phenotypes are affected by those updates, then we're all going to be in really bad shape. So if I can just uh, say we shouldn't hold ourselves to a standard uh, that is uh, different from medical care, which is that there is no guideline that is uniformly implemented in any healthcare system in this country. So to say that that's our goal, I think, uh, flies in the face of the unfortunate state of our healthcare delivery system. That being said, in addition to what Mary has just um, beautifully articulated, Emerge has created uh, something called CDSKB, the CDS knowledge base, where groups that have, in fact, uh, developed um, clinical decision support artifacts can upload those so that groups don't have to start from scratch in terms of trying to understand uh, the logic. Now, at the present time, I don't believe that any of the uh, artifacts that we have uploaded there are directly computable, meaning you could download the code and implement it, but it at least has the descriptive terms and, in many cases, a logical flow diagram about how to do it. And the CPIC uh, site and the CPIC Informatics Committee is also creating those types of uh, flow diagrams, as we saw earlier, that will help people to, you know, uh, get started so that hopefully there would be some consistency 
uh, 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 related to uh, the implementation across uh, uh, healthcare systems. Bob, and then I want to make Carol. Yeah. Sure. Um, so the uh, the goal is that the patient gets the same treatment, no matter which health system they're in. Not that everybody uses the same underlying infrastructure. So, in in some ways. The, the, the best approach would be to have a, uh, a test panel or a, a sample panel, a standard panel, which uh, once it goes through each, each individual system, the same recommendation, in effect, comes out the other end. So that the details of the implementation are only important to, to the extent that they generate the same data. So one could think about leveraging something like the, the NIST a genome in a bottle uh, model for standardizing um, this kind of approach as well. I mean, I guess I don't quite see how that translates into updating for individual patients. And again, we have this experience. I have 4,000 kids that already have genotype results in their EHRs, and then I find out that for the 15 percent who have diplotype X for this gene and the 30 percent that have diplotype Y for another gene, my interpretation has slightly changed. I have to go in and update every single one of those results for those 4,000 patients. So sending through a test thing is not really going to help me. I have to have a way of doing it in our EHR that's going to do it for all those individuals. So, so what you're looking for is that when, when that allele interpretation is needed, the interpretation is system is updated. It's not only updated, but is able to be updated for historic past legacy patients, because the other challenge right. with genetics is it's yeah, I don't lifelong. Really, yeah, I agree with that completely. Yeah, that should be part of the standard. Yeah, so Marilyn, this is really for you. So, you, so the system you described, which is, which is great, and thank you for putting it in GitHub, so that other people can access it. Starts with the VCF file, but there's a lot of steps that happen before that VCF file, right? There's, there's alignments to a specific reference. There are all kinds of different variant calling parameters that are probably different that each group uses. So has there been any testing to see how robust different parameters in getting to the VCF you know, in terms of the interpretation that you get from the, the code that you've written? Is there, I mean, to me, that, that kind of falls in line with some of these other issues about how one updates and things like that. So variation in the variant calling uh, that gets you to the VCF is going to be just as important as what you're doing. Yeah, so you're absolutely right that that step, or not step, the series of steps that get you to the VCF, so the quality of the sequencing, what QC parameters you use, what reference, um, whether you do joint calling or multi-sample calling or single sample calling, all of those things. Um, however, so we have not done extensive testing on our end because for us, it's whatever genotype is in the VCF and whether it matches one of the genotypes in those haplotype tables that's important. So how you got to that genotype, while very important, it, the genotype, so these are hard call genotypes, not kind of dosage probabilities from an imputation. So if it's whatever the genotype is, FarmCat assumes that it's accurate. And so we've kind of felt that that comparison of all those other steps is out of scope of FarmCat because the, the haplotype table says these are the alleles that are important and these are the genotypes of those alleles, and we're just interpreting those. When we write the paper, which is something Terry and I are working on, kind of have this huge section about um, all of those other elements and how critical they are. And, you know, FarmCat is starting with an assumption of clean genotype data, which it's a big assumption. I mean, you can't, if you feed in nonsense genotype calls, you're going to get nonsense CPIC haplotypes out of the other end. Um, but we haven't come up with a way to, to, to check those because they, they are what the user says they are. Well, and it's not even nonsense calls, right? It's the state of the art for the algorithms that call. It, it all goes right. back to up, updating an interpretation. You're being able to update things as the algorithms for predicting variants improves, and then the annotation for those variants changes. 
um, and keeping this, this is not a one-time thing, I think to Mary's point, you need to be able, and to Jeff's point about interpretation, you need to be able to update as technology changes, as the algorithms for interpretation change, and as the annotations change. I think that's, for implementation, that's, that's a huge challenge, I think. Yeah, no, that's right. So every time the CPIC tables would change, you would have to run it again. Um, if you, and we would update, like whatever the new CPIC pick table is, that will be the table that's in there that generates the report. Um, if a new reference genome comes out and you redo your calls and some of the genotypes have changed, you would need to run through it again. So I think, and Terry, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in the report, it will have things about the, the data set that used, the VCF, and you know, whatever genome build you were on, you know, whatever details you provide, it would be there so that you would know that it will change if you, you know, have new genotype calls. But, um, go ahead, Heidi. Just, just to interrupt for one second, it, how hard would it be to just simply take, because there's increasing use of similar standards around variant calling in terms of QD and mapping quality, for example, and if you just took those two parameters um, into account, could you, in the same way you're essentially dealing with the fact that there may be missing genotypes and flagging that, could you also incorporate flagging of, you know, low mapping quality and, and low QD? Scores. So I'm guessing what it would be is a pre um, analysis that we, we would, could run on the VCF prior to running FarmCat, where you basically just get a report of these are the, the variants that have low QD or low quality scores, and that maybe those then get kind of wrapped into the report at the end. So if one of the critical alleles had a really low quality, at least it's a caveat or a warning that it's low quality. Um, Yeah, I don't think that, uh, I'll repeat what Terry said if anybody's listening online. Um, so she said, we, cur we don't think that we currently take into account the quality score, but it's a good idea and something that we could look into. So Josh and then Sandy and then Lynn. I just wanted to make an, a, a sort of a build on Mark's point about um, CDSKB. The, um, uh, you know, for, for it is Ignite and Emerge. One small little asterisk there. Um, the, uh, the, uh, but the other thing is, you know, some of the reasons that some of those elements are not computable is that we can't actually share computable elements that are derived from instance from Epic. Um, and, and so the, um, so we are limited to sharing in a lot of cases things like screenshots or, or text that come from the BPAs or things like that um, from those of us who may use certain uh, s vendors' systems. Um, the, uh, I, I will suggest though, you know, having the logic and the wording that you actually have around a decision support module, even if you have to re-implement it, is a help, um, I think, for other people implementing. Sandy, uh, Lynn, and then Julie. Yeah, in my view, relative to the question of how can we get clinical, oh, sorry, how can we get clinical decision support consistent for pharmacogenomics? I, I really think that there are three components to this, three phases. The first is we need to be able to be transferring the genetic results in a way that's computable. And I think that Marilyn's work could really be helpful here relative to the advantage we have in this area for pharmacogenomics is that the results we found in digitized, the results are easier to describe and accessible to describing through LOINC specifically. So, like the idea of taking FarmCat and potentially using that to inform a standardized set of LOINC codes, I think could be, could be really powerful. It won't work, I don't think, if we were talking about like HCM, but I do think for pharmacogenomics it can. So, so I think that's the first step, is getting the data moving so that it can be computed. The second step is we need the knowledge represented in a way that's accessible. And I think that that could potentially be accomplished by putting interfaces on top of ClinVar or ClinGen that are intended to be used by, um, for, for clinical purposes. Maybe not real-time clinical purposes, but intended to be used for clinical purposes. And then the third phase is representing the knowledge itself, which I think can be represented. I, I totally agree with the issue that Josh brought up, but having that 
represented in um, the um, the CDS repository. I think I think can get to that. Thanks, Andy. Lynn, um, before you ask your question, I'm going to try to put you on the spot because you represent an important constituency here, which are the community-based health systems trying to implement. And so one of the things I'd like you to at least speak to is what is missing from, from the tools that you've seen that will enable you to be successful. Well, I was going to comment on what was there that is very useful. So let me do that first. Um, firstly, as a community health system, especially in the non-cancer arena, we couldn't do our CDS support without CPIC, without Digitize, and we're very interested, I'm very interested in what Marilyn and so many others have, have shown today. I am the person that's supposed to be integrating all this information along with my clinical pharmacist, thank goodness I have one, um, but it's a lot to do. It's wonderful, and, and I'm, I'm, again, I, we couldn't do this without your support. But as we go into some of our pilot studies that we're doing in the community with primary care docs, we are seeing obviously not just drug gene interactions, but drug drug gene interactions. And a lot of our clinical summaries that we give to the physicians include not only, you know, you might want to consider an alternate drug or an alternate dose, but especially for the intermediate metabolizers, you may want to also monitor other, you know, CYP2D6 inhibitors or CYP2C19 inhibitors. And, you know, we're still on our drug gene CDS and hoping to get those alerts running and then looking at across the board a CYP2D6 variation and what does that mean for a variety of polypharmacy, which is what our, our population is. So I guess my question is, is that a next step that, you know, these nuanced interpretations where you do have drug-drug gene interactions as well as drug gene interactions, still I, I would love to see that as part of our clinical decision support because it's just about 50 percent of the, of at least what we're seeing right now. Do want to respond to that? Yeah, so, so, so I think, you know, absolutely we, we want to be able to, to support that. I do think that the largest, from an IT, from the IT component of this, I think the largest challenge is getting that base data accessible. You know, each individual test that you want to consider, getting that test represented in a uniform enough way such that you're going to be comfortable with the clinical decision support acting on that. And then once we have that, then I think that it's a little easier to build the, the overlying um, CDS rules architecture. I guess, you know, it, we're, I totally hear what you're saying. For the clinician, the clinician needs to hear the recommendations that take into account everything with the patient, not just the pharmacogene status. Drug-drug interactions, renal function, liver function, age, history of surgery, um, you know, there's a long list of things for allergies. <laughs> we, we, we have a, a diverse set of CDS built into our EHR, and unfortunately, there's separate underlying databases for every one of those pieces of information, and it's very rare that we integrate multiple different types, like we, now we have one that does age and genetics for voriconazole but it doesn't include liver function, it doesn't include renal function, and, and I'm at a place where, you know, I think we're practicing at a pretty high level and we treat only children with cancer. I, I totally hear what you're saying, but I just think that that's a, a big ask, um, and I, I don't realistically see it coming from the genetics community. I wish that we had better integrated CDS for all of healthcare, but I don't know of any place that's doing it really great right now. So, uh, Mary, so Mark. I, I completely agree. I think where we're coming from is a, um, you know, how do you, we have one clinical pharmacist for an entire health system that is expert in pharmacogenetics. And to scale up, um, first we need the clinical decision support for the drug gene interactions. I'm completely in agreement with that, and that keeps me up at night because that's not happening. But then 
just within the space of pharmacogenetics, there's also this other aspect of this, you know, drug-drug gene interaction that may also be just as detrimental or problematic. And I just don't want us to lose sight of that. Yeah, I think that the key here is that um, uh, since this session is on uh, resources, I think this is a key resource gap, that right now we don't have that integrative piece. And I think um, my belief, and I think it's shared by some, if not all, around the table, is that ultimately this has to fall into the realm of the clinical pharmacologist. That pharmacogenomics has sort of been an unusual case in the sense that it's sort of emerged outside of that realm. But everything else that we're talking about is in the realm of the clinical pharmacologist at the present time. Um, so I think that there's a gap in terms of training and synthesis that really has to take place if we're going to successfully implement over time. And so I think part of the things that I would want to see coming out of this meeting would be how do we engage in the training programs for pharmacists and pharmacologists to ultimately transition this information, which is now standalone, into something that um, is uh, going to be part of it. And I know that uh, Julie's uh, program and Mary's. Why don't we ask Dean <laughs> Johnson? <laughs> yes, <laughs> who's next up anyway. But that, to me, is a key. Yeah, so as Dean of a College of Pharmacy and immediate past president of the American Society of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, I think many of us in the room would disagree that this hasn't been driven by clinical pharmacologists. Um, I mean, if you look at the Ignite affiliate members, um, I think we're at 15 or 20. Um, they're almost all focused in pharmacogenomics and they're most all clinical pharmacists. So, I mean, I think this field is being driven by clinical pharmacists and clinical pharmacologists. Um, so, and, and, I, and I think there are many, I mean, they are, in the colleges of pharmacy, there are acquired accreditation standards around pharmacogenomics that's better in some places than others just because, um, you know, the, the manpower isn't quite there. But, um, I mean, I think pharmacy schools are way ahead of other healthcare disciplines in educating that space. Um, but I wanted to comment on sort of the CDS uh, support and issues generally. So reflecting on several things that we heard, one is the only way that those of us around the table have ultimately been able to make this work is by using grant funding to buy into our clinical um, effort for uh, implementation. That's not scalable. That is not going to work if this is going to work. Um, I mean, you know, systems across the country are not going to be able to get NIH funding to help um, build in their CDS. You know, and then there are the challenges of epic upgrades and how do you upgrade. And so, I mean, I've really begun to wonder about whether we are approaching this completely wrong. And, and I use the drug interaction as an example, and it's not that that's a perfect system, um, but people don't go in and build drug interaction data into their new Epic build. They buy a plug-in from one of three large vendors, and they use that. And, and so I, I think you have to wonder if something like that and, and this is much more complex than drug interactions. But the reality is that we really need a tool that probably is a plug-in that's constantly updated that includes drug interactions, drug-drug, gene interactions, drug-gene interactions, and, and maybe renal function and liver function. But, um, you know, as we have thought about scaling in our own system, as you hear about all of the challenges, I mean, I have just begun to believe that this whole idea of trying to build into your EPIC system or whatever system you're on is just never going to work. And so, you know, how, and, and so this means really probably a commercial product, but how we get there, I've begun, I've begun to believe it's the only way we can get there on any scale and move kind of beyond this room and a few other major academic medical centers. Yeah. I wanted to pick up on that idea, too. I, I think that we have been going about it wrong in the sense of, you know, waiting for the large randomized trial to the justify putting one gene in, but also from the standpoint of, you know, changing the EMRs that we all have. I had the same experience as Mark, you know, your thousandth on the list of upgrades that they want to make. And so uh, we, we just got a grant yesterday, actually, at our hospital where we actually took a different attack, tact and said, this is a quality and safety issue, and it can't be uh, ignored. And they finally, you know, recognize that in that way, and so it moves then to the top of the list. And I think we could make that case for a lot of the drugs we're talking about, certainly the 
in a patient story we heard this morning. And maybe that's a different way to, to convince people. Dick? So certainly at our place, it is a quality and safety issue. We've taken exactly the same tack. In terms of what we've learned, and we've, we've learned a good deal, and uh, what, what people like me thought we knew uh, has not always been correct, the pro in terms of both the underlying science and the implementation, it's been driven by, I agree with you, Julie, by clinical pharmacologists and clinical pharmacists. Uh, I think that's true. You look at the PGRN network and who the PIs are. It hasn't come out of basic pharmacology, and I'm based in a basic pharmacology department because they haven't been that interested in human variation. And so that's okay. This is where it's come from. But we're coming back to talk about training then. Who did we really find at our place where we have uh, 19 drug gene pairs that fire for every one of our 1.4 million patients? So they're through, through our entire system. We put a great deal of effort into educating the physicians, and Eric heard me say this when I was at NHGRI. And so that's right there. It's called Ask Mayo Expert. As soon as an alert comes up, the doctor can look at that information. The fact of the matter is almost none of them did. What they immediately did was pick up the phone and call the pharmacist. And what did the pharmacist do? They were terrified because they didn't, had never heard of exons, introns, splice junctions, none of that. So we immediately realized we had to educate the pharmacist. And we have hundreds of pharmacists on our campus. I mean, it's, it was scary when I heard the number, Julie. I, I think that's great. So they have an obligatory education program before we implement any drug gene pair of rules because they're on the front line. What's happened is the young pharmacists are embracing this as a career path, and I know that that's happened at your place too. So now we find we've just hired two additional pharmacogenomics trained pharmacists farm from PharmD programs, and they take care of the difficult concept consults, because we don't have enough doctors to do that anyway, and certainly not who are trained in it. But this brings us back to training. In RT32 for clinical pharmacology, there's an overdose of pharmacogenomics, and there is at Steve Leader's place in his program I just visited there. But we need to be thinking about who actually is going in, both in academic medical centers and elsewhere, will, for the difficult cases, be available to consult on these patients. And my conclusion, based on our own experience, is primarily it will be the, the PharmDs who have been trained with a PGY two year in pharmacogenomics. I see the dean nodding her head. It makes me feel a lot better when, when that happens. So I think those are among the things. I mean, we're now, we're doing this in many of the centers around this table. We've learned a lot of lessons. And I think what we need to be thinking about is, all right, how do we, cha how do we train the person power for the future? Who, is, who are really going to be on the front lines as this happens. And I don't think I've said anything that the dean would argue with too, too vehemently. Is, is that correct? So I'll just follow up with a couple of, um, uh, one comment related to what uh, Julie was saying about scalability. I think it's, um, in terms of funding this off grants, it's not so much an issue of, I mean, it's partly an issue of scalability, but it's also sustainability. I don't know of any NIH uh, funding mechanism that goes uh, ad infinitum or ad nauseum, whatever the, the term might be. Um, in terms of Dick's point with respect to training, we, we've taken a little bit of a different tact at, at our place. We've had a pediatric clinical pharmacology training program for about 20, well, 18 years, uh, let's say, and we always had trouble recruiting into the program when the product was a pediatric clinical pharmacologist. They have no billable services, and so it's really difficult to make a living. Um, when we started marketing it as a pediatric subspecialist with um, a unique toolkit, um, then things changed. And so now all of a sudden we have 10 pediatric subspecialists um, who added an extra year to their um, clinical subspecialty training, and they now think about problems related to variability in drug response in their patients in a very different um, um, way. And so I think it's, it's, it's all about the way we uh, present it. In, in our program, we actually have probably three to four physicians for every um, clinical pharmacist or PharmD that we've uh, taken into the program. I think ultimately that's the, uh, the group that will be making the decisions or at least will be responsible for the decisions. So they need to understand what it is that they are deciding um, um, about. 
but it's still, it's, it's still education. And the final point I wanted to make is that uh, sometimes we have to change what it is that we say we're doing to meet uh, whatever's hot. And, and so we're starting to find that adding the word analytics to something gets people's uh, um, attention. So, um, you know, don't call it therapeutic drug uh, monitoring anymore. Call it something else and add analytics and, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, yeah, 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 call it big data, big data or, or something. Uh, uh, something, yeah, something analytics, and it changes uh, the perception by the people that you need to actually uh, help you do it. Thanks. Sandy? I just wanted to comment on the idea of externalizing this support into a commercial product that's separate from the EHR. I, I totally agree that that's where this needs to go. Um, hopefully, we in this room can sort of orient towards open source-based commercial models, but. I think it does, for broad adoption, need that. But just a couple caveats that I think that, that, that we should be aware of. So there's a lot of things that make pharmacogenomic CDS simpler than other areas, but one of the things that makes it more complex is that it, it invariably has to be event-based. So you have to be interacting with the, the EHR's underlying event model, understanding when things are being um, prescribed and, under, and intervene as opposed to pulling things out into a totally separate app that can be, you know, brought up based on um, a user action. So as a result, I don't think externalizing this is going to totally solve the problem of needing internal clinical IT resources in order to, to get these projects um, over the goal line. Um, and I do think once we're into that realm or remaining in that realm, I think that the key is really demonstrating clinical and ideally economic value in order to mobilize those, those resources to make that happen, which I do think that, you know, the kind of grant funding model can help um, generate. So, I mean, that's why I use the drug interactions as a model, because it has to interface with the prescribing that's happening in the record, right? So it, it does have to link into that to work. So it, it clearly has to be that kind of model. Yeah. And, but I mean, there are problems sometimes with those three drug interaction databases when we get updates from Cerner and everything falls apart. But I, I agree that sounds like the way to go. When you said, Sandy, that you thought it really is, it takes more effort from the in-house IT people than the EHR vendors are ever going to be able to provide. Can you just expand on that a little bit? I mean, I would say, I know Terry and I have been contacted by representatives from the major EHR companies, and they've asked, can we steal all the CPIC content and build something off of it? And we say, yeah. But I, I don't know exactly what they're doing, but it seems like to be scalable, it would be ideal sometime in the future if EHR vendors take responsibility for this, doesn't it, or? Yeah, so I, oh, sorry. So I 100% agree that that's where we want to go. I think that there is a standard that's emerging called CDS hooks, where if that was truly to, to take hold, that would give a standardized event model into this area. I think that it's more just a question of, in the short term, what's the most pragmatic way to, um, to make this happen? And just within Digitize, we've just found it's migrated you know, Epic and Cerner have been great in this particular area where they've, they've really supported the effort, but it still kind of comes down to the internal efforts. But I do agree, it can mature into, so drug-drug interactions, there's a, there's a mature, you know, infrastructure surrounding that, and that's where we'd want to get to. Um, the three vendors that do drug-drug interactions got me on my, uh, <laughs> another uh, gap here. Um, one of the challenges is, um, and anybody that deals with these knows that uh, you can't prescribe a medication without being flagged for some type of a drug-drug interaction unless there's been extensive work, which I'm sure has happened at your institutions, to try and get rid of the ones that are useless. And Like methotrexate 6-MP. Yeah, exactly. So um, every time you, um, and when you talk to the vendors about that, they, you say, well, why can't you create a smarter thing? And they say, well, we can, but we don't want the liability. 
uh, we, we want you to have the liability, so if you want to turn something off, you can turn it off. But what it really reflects is a larger problem, which is we always default to alerts and reminders when we interact with our clinicians. And we all know the problems that are related to relying on alerts and reminders, which is our clinicians tend to click through them because they just want to get their work done. And so I think one of the aspects that we need to incorporate as we think about implementation is, is there a different way that we can re-engineer this workflow so that we can get the information in their hands and, uh, and operate under best practices, but not necessarily have the clinicians aware that we're doing it. So an example would be, and, and this is a fictional workflow, um, is that if you had uh, a variant uh, that would predispose for, to uh, an adverse event, so let's say you have STAR-5 in SLCO1B1, and I want to prescribe a statin because you have uh, elevated cholesterol. If I could go into a pick list to say, I want to pick a statin for this patient, and simvastatin didn't show up on the pick list because the system knows that this person has star 5 and that the and the highest risk for an adverse event relates to simvastatin. Well, we've just operated a decision support that the clinician doesn't know has happened, but we've reduced the risk for an adverse event. Now, if the clinician says, I want to order simvastatin, and they start to type it in, then you alert them, you say, hey, there's a reason we didn't show you simvastatin on the pick list, and this is it. But um, you know, these types of workflows where you can really get high reliability and, and uh, you know, guide the process when you have evidence that's at a sufficient level that you can sort of automate it is something we need to be thinking about more, and that's not part of the current research agenda related to implementation in this space. So a, uh, a couple of um, things as we're thinking about uh, who we're training, I think two groups we want to make sure we don't uh, leave out. One is the nurses. Um, there is a, you know, they're the ones who are directly interacting with the patients, probably spending more time than, uh, than a lot of the providers, uh, and there is a definite interest uh, in that group. As one of my close collaborators is the uh, Associate Dean of Nursing uh, at IU, and uh, they're, you know, doing this. There's a lot of people that are very interested in it, but there's within NINR at NIH, there hasn't been much uh, funding or uh, it seems like they've had other uh, priorities. So I think that's one group also that we can get a lot of information <coughs> to, the, um, uh, to the patients. And the other is we need to make sure that we don't uh, forget the patients themselves as uh, people that if the, the educational materials are made available in the appropriate um, uh, you know, avenues so they can actually get it. As we heard this morning, a postal worker within a year becoming a pharmacogenetics uh, really expert in one year. Uh, I mean, when, you know, when, when people have their, you know, their genome, they get very, or their variants, they actually, as patients, get very interested in that, and they have, you know, a lot more time to actually uh, go and look some of these things up, of which when they go then to the providers, um, they can actually uh, use some of that. So I think we need to make sure we don't leave out those two groups. Thanks. So we have about five more minutes before we break for a photograph and then uh, launch. Uh, Lynn, you've come up with the gaps that you want to see filled in, in your place? No, I just, I just checked the website and it's really, really nice compared to eight months ago, which was they, you were building. No, I wanted to follow up on Mark's comment um, and it's something that we um, get a lot of pushback from our informatics committee, our physicians informatics committee of, oh, not another rule. and. Certainly, what we try to do is minimize the physician seeing what's going on in terms of the clinical decision support. So two cases in point, uh, carbamazepine and abacavir. Now, carbamazepine, our folks really weren't aware of the risks in carbamazepine. Um, abacavir, every ID doc says, look, we, we order this, it, it's in the EMR, I'm like, I can't find it, where is it, you know, someplace it's under the immunology tab. So as we develop the CDS support, it is looking for results first and then, you know, firing only when you don't have a result or if the result is positive, if the result is negative, nothing is going to fire. And so that aspect of being you know, having a lot going on behind the scenes, um, I, I, I completely agree with you. If we could do more of that, um, we would love to. We have a Cerner system, and, and it's been flexible enough, but not completely flexible. So, um, Terry? 
just to sort of ask, in, in terms of resources that we like, um, I think Marilyn or, or maybe Julie mentioned there there are three vendors that you get um, uh, your your drug drug interaction tables. From. Are are any of them interested in developing drug gene interaction tables? So um, one, at least one or two of the companies were at our precision medicine conference. So my sense is they're starting to pay attention. Um, and figure out. I mean, I completely agree with Mark. The drug-drug interaction stuff is a mess, um, you know, and there's so many things that are not really clinically important. So I'm not sure that that group is the one we want doing this because I think they've, they've created a bit of a nightmare because clinicians do zip right past um, important drug interactions because they get so many sort of false alerts. But um, I, I mean, my sense is that they are paying attention and they are working to figure out how to begin to integrate drug-drug gene interactions, whether they're thinking about sort of a pure tool that's just pharmacogenetics when there's not a drug interaction, I'm not sure of. But um, I mean, I, 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 I put it forward as a model, not that those three are the answer to our solution. So, so recognizing, as, uh, as Dick uh, mentioned, that, um, that uh, we need to enhance training, particularly of uh, potentially clinical pharmacologists, um, I'm just wondering uh, if any of you have, uh, have thought about pushing these resources to the clinical pharmacists in the community. So they're sort of outside the EMR, or EHR network, and they're always uh, obviously interfacing with patients and could provide um, CDS guided recommendations for, for drugs as well. So, is, are any of you in that space? Uh, I guess three, um, all, let's just. Yeah, so um, one of the things that uh, Geisinger has done that's been very innovative is they've, they actually developed a community pharmacist management model, and so this was uh, really um, taken on to address some commonly occurring problems like diabetes and hypertension, medication adherence, polypharmacy, et cetera. And we found that um, uh, by empowering the community pharmacist, training the community pharmacist to interact with the patient, that we actually get much better outcomes than if we put that in the hands of the um, patient, uh, of the physician. Uh, just because they have more time, they interact with the, uh, the patient more frequently, uh, it just works better. So we're looking to expand that model initially into uh, management of familial hypercholesterolemia, um, but also to use it for medication review when we have individuals with uh, variants in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, long QT, to say are there medications on there that they probably shouldn't be on because they have one of these conditions. And our ultimate um, goal is to create an educational program for all of our community pharmacists and to uh, be able to move. Uh, we're developing a, uh, uh, taking advantage of the patient-facing genomic test report uh, that we developed previously that's paired with a provider report. In the pharmacogenomic space, we're going to have patient, provider, and pharmacist reports designed by those end users to get that information out and hopefully tie it all together. So that's something that we're investing quite heavily in. Kristen, uh, then Lynn, and then, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. So I think it's, I agree, it's a really important and huge issue, and I think we just, Julie mentioned our Precision Medicine Conference, and it was a huge focus because of our attendees, and it was uh, primarily pharmacists, the majority of them were community-based, either from a, a health system or community-based pharmacist, and so I think we're really at a point where we really, it, there is action, it is happening in the community pharmacy, kind of external to our conversations, and I think there's an opportunity for us to bring those two groups together because the community pharmacist is kind of placed in this practice and model where they, they are already engaged in these types of services through different models such as medication therapy management, and they're very interested in becoming involved. And I think learning and partnering with those groups and also at the same time equipping them to be able to make evidence-based decisions and recommendations uh, is a huge component um, and where there's a lot of push versus pull um, in this area. So it seems like there should be some community pharmacists around the table. Lynn? Yes. Um, oh, no. Well, let go. Lynn first and then you. And I am not a community pharmacist, but um, would love to have uh, Kristen um, advise us and others. At Mission, we do have our own retail community pharmacies. There's about eight of them throughout this rural region. And in terms of scale up, they're all very interested in learning about pharmacogenetics and being able to interact with the patient and also interact with the physician in this triangle. Me not being a, a clinical pharmacist or a community pharmacist, I didn't realize that the 
dispensing software that is used in the community pharmacy, you know, doesn't interface with our EMR. And I said, well, what do you mean? We're all on the same EMR. And they're like, well, we can't. We have to go into another system. And so the clinical decision support that we're building in our EMR, I recognize now, is not available in the dispensing software. And we're starting to hear about companies who are going to the retail pharmacies with dispensing software information about pharmacogenetics. And before that gets out of hand, not to undermine our our work and our field would would love to understand the efforts that might be going on to help train in the retail pharmacy setting, but also um, have it interfaced in some way with the other work that is going on so we're not duplicating efforts in two different systems. Hi, I'm Micheline Piquette. Um, I'm from Canada. I'm from the University of Toronto. Anyways, I'm part of a project, um, research project. It's a small pilot project, which is called Prime, Pharmacists as Personalized Medicine Experts. Um, so we, what our goal was to train 25 pharmacists in the community and to have them actually do the ordering of the genetic tests and to look at both the physician perception as well as the patient perception and how, this, how pharmacists were able to incorporate this into their day-to-day -day life. Um, so we put a call out for the pharmacists, and within less than a week, we had 143 volunteers, uh, of which we had to choose 25. And we did an um, a extensive online and in-person training program, probably about three to four hours online and two days in-person training. The pharmacists became much more confident and competent, and they felt empowered to be able to do this. Um, so this is, they started recruiting patients into their study um, about a year ago, and we have about uh, over 125 patients that the pharmacists recruited into the study and did their genetic tests and interpreted. And overall, the, the response was overwhelming, and the sat patient satisfaction with their treatment plans in, went dramatically from about 20% satisfaction to over 60% satisfaction. Um, there was uh, several of the patients wrote in and said how this is th the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, we had a lot of the physicians also, once they got used to having the pharmacists doing the tests, started actually really incorporating this as well too. So, um, so yes, I agree that so we are finishing up the study at the end of June and we are hoping to publish it at some point. <laughs> and, um, um, and, but we'd like to do a larger scale study, obviously, because this was, we only had a grant for $50,000 um, from the Canadian Foundation uh, Pharmacy, and it was a, it called an innovative grant. Um, there was not much we could do with $50,000, and right now we're trying to find more. Thank you. Um, uh, Marilyn, you have the last word. Nice. Um, so I think the, the idea of engaging the clinical pharmacists is a really good one. They are the clinicians that catch things like drug-drug interaction. So for me, any time I've been prescribed something that there is some sort of you know, warning or something related to my hypertension meds, my doctor, my doctor knows that I'm on the hypertension meds. They prescribe them. It's when I go to the retail pharmacy that the pharmacist goes, hold on, I need to talk to you for a minute. Do you know this? Or mm, let me call back. I actually think you should take this instead of that because of this contraindication. So I think they are the, the front line with patients for those drug-drug interactions. And a second point, I've talked to a few of the pharmacists at Geisinger, especially thinking about the retail pharmacy and how you know I use a retail pharmacy. Um, and so they don't have my EHR. But the one data element that they always have that matches my EHR, and this is the only kind of data field that I can tell that is always the same, and every time I go to the clinic or the pharmacy, they ask about it, is allergies, drug allergies. If we can figure out how to put the pharmacogenetic tests of relevance for that patient into drug allergies, it won't be missed by their physician, their nurse, or their pharmacist, because it comes up every time. I hope your name is also the same. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I meant clinical data elements, not PHI. So thank you all for uh, a great hour of discussion on this. Uh, so um, uh, first, thanks, thanks for the speakers. Let's give them a round of applause.
And um, now, uh, in the five minutes between now and lunch, uh, we're going to take a photograph. Where, where is it? Out outside that door. So wear your sunglasses. And um, and uh, one other message from Teji is that speakers for the next session should um, either bring their uh, jump drives up there so the presentations can be loaded before you speak. Thank you.